a uh, good morning and welcome you all uh, in this uh, emerging technology webinar actually this said i am a host for this webinar if you have any question and queries please put question on chat box i will dare to help you out Uh, moving ahead and talking about event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics Learning is an India most distinguished learning company in IT technology. We are ready with our top uh, class learning solution that can be to fit every requirement in every sector across every industry and around the globe. Synergetics Learning Solution offering that is persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add-on solution, uh, certification solution, certification add-on solution, risk killing solution, emerging technology training solution, uh, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, practice playbook solution and architecting solution. Uh, today webinar is organized by ETC community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. Our ETC community is open to all the people who are interested in emerging technology uh, and you just need to follow our emerging technology communities, communities. You just have to install the meetup app in your phone and device there you can follow our communities. And you and you have to follow the code of conduct. Please note, no one is allowed to take a screenshot of this webinar and cannot do screen recording. Also, if you have any technical question, please uh, put question on chat box. We will dare to help you out. Today's speaker for this webinar is Sonu Satya Das. He is a Microsoft certified trainer. He has 12 plus years of experience in training and development in various Microsoft and open source technology. Currently work with Synergetics as a practice head. Agenda for this webinar, you will get an overview of the topic and more. Uh, participants also I shared the upcoming ATT webinar details so interested participants can go and register themselves. Uh, make sure you follow us on our uh, social media platform like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for relevant update and upcoming webinars details. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic uh, Sonu sir. OK, thank you. Hello everyone. Hope I am audible to all of you. So myself, uh, Sonu, and I'm the speaker for today's uh, session. Today we are going to talk about the NCash distributed caching solution with uh, .NET Core for building scalable distributed apps. So I'm uh, working in Microsoft and open source technologies primarily, and I am a Microsoft certified trainer on the Azure Cloud platform, conducting sessions on various open source technologies. Today's uh, agenda is to understand the distributed applications, distributed caching with uh, NCache and its pros and cons and how we can use that with .NET. Starting with the distributed applications. What is distributed applications? We have seen different types of applications in different platforms. And we are using those applications either in our PCs or uh, uh, mobiles or some other devices. The applications that we use is running from a server. We are accessing those applications over internet. Most of these applications are either web applications or service oriented applications. When we build the applications, we choose either a distributed application pattern or a monolithic application pattern. So in a monolithic application pattern, 
we used to build the entire modules of the application and deploy that complete project into a single server. But when it comes to distributed microservice based applications or distributed web applications, we build the applications either as independent modules or as a single project and we deploy them in multiple servers for better scalability and high availability. Which means whenever a user makes a request from the client application, the request goes to a load balancer or an API gateway, which is then forwarded to one of the backend server that is configured behind the load balancer. And the server is responsible to execute the request. And if the request requires some dynamic data from the database, the application in the server will connect to the database, load the data, and make the response and send it back. As you can see in the picture, whenever the request comes from the client applications, the gateway service, maybe a load balancer or application gateway or some other kind of uh, proxy service, forward this request to one of the server instance. And then the server connects to the database for fetching the data and send this reply. Why we are deploying our applications into multiple servers? It's because of scalability and high availability. Which means whenever we deploy our application in a single server, there is a chance for downtime because if there is an application uh, exception or the server failure, the entire application instance can go down and the users will not be able to go and access the application. To avoid this, we usually create multiple instances of the servers and then deploy applications in each server. And these servers will be configured behind a load balancer so that when the request comes, the load balancer randomly picks one of the server that can execute the request and get the response. When it comes to microservice based distributed applications, we build the project into different individual applications or individual uh, projects and deploy them in different servers. Means different parts of the application is going to handle different uh, operations. For example, in an e-commerce application, we can have the uh, applications or services for handling the product based request, order based request, catalog, or oh, sorry, the um, cart based request, or user authentication and authorization related request, or payment request. So we can have different uh, projects for handling different types of queries or different types of requests, and all of them can run in distributed servers. And they can communicate each other using some well known communication patterns like uh, REST APIs or message driven application or message driven uh, uh, pattern like a publish subscribe patterns or event based solutions or RPC pattern, GRPC kind of patterns. So we are host these distributed applications either in physical servers or in the cloud servers. So now most of the organization prefers cloud because it is a highly scalable platform because whenever the number of requests increases, 
it can add more number of servers dynamically. That's not possible with a physical server uh, in our on-premise environments. So for better scalability, organizations prefer to deploy their applications on the cloud environments. So what are the features of distributed applications? As I have mentioned, it offers better scalability. Means distributed applications can easily adapt to increasing demands by adding more resources to the network. Which means if you are deploying your application on a cloud environment, you can start with a single server instance. As the number of requests increases, you can keep adding more number of servers. And whenever the demand decreases, you can remove those additionally created server instances. Means dynamic scalability you can achieve in uh, with the with the cloud servers while deploying the distributed applications. Resilience. Failure of a single device does not triple the entire application ensuring consistent availability. Since you are deploying your application in a distributed manner, if one server goes down, it will not affect the entire application's availability. It will affect, but only a particular part of the application or particular functionality of the application may not work, but the entire application never goes down. Security is another feature. Distributed data storage and decentralized computing enhance security measures. So you can configure different security patterns or different security mechanisms for different types of servers. Suppose if you have some public accessing endpoints and some private endpoints, you don't need to put all of them together in a single server. Instead of that, the publicly accessible endpoints or the application which is publicly accessed can be deployed as a separate server. And those uh, which are private endpoints, you can deploy in different servers. And you can configure different uh, network firewall and authentication schemes or authentication methods for these applications. Transparency is another feature. Now, if you see most of the distributed applications we build using the open source technologies, uh, such as uh, JavaScript technologies or maybe Python or uh, uh, open source databases like uh, in, uh, MongoDB or the the uh, uh, Cassandra or that kind of uh, open source and free databases or the NoSQL databases are supported or you can even go with the relational databases like the PostgreSQL or MySQL. So most of these modern applications are now built using the open source technologies. An open source nature of some distributed application fosters trust and community involvement. So this open source technologies are driven by larger communities. So you will get the better community support when you go with open source technologies. So what are the benefits of using distributed applications? First is enhanced performance. Distributed workload processing leads to faster response times and smoother user experience. Since these applications are running in different servers, a request coming from the user is not going to a single server. It is processed by different servers. So because each server or each application instance is going to handle different functionalities. So if it is a read request for a product, then that will be handled by one server. 
But if it is going to be a write operation for an order, then it will be handled by another server. Code efficiency. Shared resources and reduced hardware requirements minimize the infrastructure cost. Most of the distributed applications can use shared infrastructure and shared resources. For example, if you want to use a database, you can use database and caching solutions as a shared resource. You can use a uh, file storage as a common storage solution. You can deploy these resources into the distributed network environment. Global reach, accessibility from any device across the globe's expands potential user base. So since these modern applications we deploy in distributed cloud environment, we can access those applications from anywhere using any device from any platform. So it increases the user base. So more number of users can go and access the application. Innovation, open source platforms and community development fuel rapid innovation and customization. The mo modern distributed application, as I have mentioned, these modern distributed applications are now built using the open source technologies and they are driven by communities and every day some new inventions new contributions are happening in the open source industry so you can go and adopt this new technologies to build the modern distributed applications but yes Whenever we talk about a technology, there will be benefits or advantages as well as disadvantages. So what are the challenges for building distributed applications? Data consistency. Ensuring data consistency across various nodes in a distributed network can be complex. Since these applications we are running from different servers, it will be difficult for a developer to ensure the data consistency because one application may be reading the data from the underlying data source, but the other application instance may be writing something to the same server instance or same database instance. So multiple applications go and read or write the data from a single data source can lead the consistency issues. So we have to take care of these consistency issues while building this distributed application. Latency and network issues. Delays in communication between nodes can impact user experience and application performance. Network bandwidth limitations, geographical distances, and unreliable connections can further intensify these issues. See, when we create an application as a single monolithic kind of application, all the functionalities of that application runs from a single server. And the intercommunication between the modules in the application is faster because all the functionalities are running from same server. But when we go for distributed applications where these modules or functionalities runs from different servers, they have to communicate over internet or a private network to uh, uh, access the data from the other or the, to communicate each other. They have to send and receive the request over the network and that creates a latency and also if there is some network issues or a bandwidth 
problem it can also lead to the communication issues there will be a latency for accessing suppose if this distributed applications are deployed in different geographical locations that also can lead a, uh, to latency for accessing the application and also it is very important when we deploy the distributed applications the person who is managing infrastructure must have a good understanding how these applications are communicating or which of the modules are communicating each other because he needs to open necessary port numbers uh, configure the firewall for communicating through uh, means communicating over the network but if you go with a single monolithic kind of application it's not a problem because all the functionalities will run from a single server and it will be an in process communication between the modules user adoption is another problem or another challenge educating users about the benefits and complexities of the distributed application can be challenging because people will be familiar with monolithic kind of applications and making them understand about distributed architecture what are the different components can go as a uh, individual instance so that making them understand about the architecture and their complexities is very difficult building intuitive user interfaces and ensuring seamless interoperability with existing systems are crucial to encourage broader adoption so when you build the distributed applications typically what we do we deploy the back end services as a distributed application and front end can be created with some kind of uh, uh, front end development technologies like angular react vue or even dotnet blazor something something like that so in such scenarios ensuring the communication between the front end and the back end and between the modules is very important so the front end developer must have a good understanding what are the different endpoints endpoints to connect for accessing the functionality so caching data in applications so when you build distributed applications or data driven applications an important part of the application is caching of the data in the applications so currently we can see there are different pain points in the application development if you see users face uh, agonizing wait of content to appear leading to frustration and abandonment so what is the problem since we access the data uh, since we access the data from different uh, uh, databases or from the back end it may leads to latency because the data will be coming from the database and the database will be deployed as a the database will be deployed as a separate server so accessing the data from the uh, database creates a latency for users end users because the user makes a request to the application the application makes a request to the database and then the data will be loaded into the uh, application then the application will be sending the data back to the user 
in that case making continuous request to the database servers affect the performance of the database servers and if the server is busy in processing a large request or uh, higher data request you may need to wait for getting the data such cases the user may leave the application or the user may not be interested to use such applications because of long waiting times applications repeatedly fetch the same data from the servers creating unnecessary strain and inefficiency if you see whenever we makes continuous request to the application the application will connect to the database every time for each and every request will affect the performance of the server because we may be fetching the same data from the server each and every time to load the same data from the backend data sources why we have to go and connect to the database every time because every time we are going to load almost same data for different users making a query to the database for loading such data can affect the performance of the entire application if it is a small set of data then it will be fine but if it is a larger data set we have to get for each and every request it will be a uh, it will be a, a pain point or it will be a, a constraint for the application performance overburdened servers high traffic causes server overload resulting in crashes and the poor user experience as we have mentioned the higher traffic to the servers will crash the server and uh, gives a poor user experience so what is the solution the solution is caching if you see caching provides faster data access frequently accessed data is stored locally in a cache and we can easily fetch the data from the caching server so we don't need to go and connect to the database servers for fetching the data because we whenever if you are using a relational database we have to send a sql query and the sql query may be a very a uh, lengthy one that contains multiple joins that connect to different databases sorry data tables and uh, aggregating the data and returns so each and every time making such a request will affect the performance so instead of that we make so request one time fetch the data and we can store that data into a caching server the subsequent request can go and get the data from the caching server instead of database reduce the server load caching offload the work from the servers as i have mentioned the subsequent requests are not going to the database for loading the data it can go to the caching server so the caching server can return the data very quickly because it's a already prepared data it's not going to execute the queries and generating or aggregating the data it just uh, return the aggregated data which is already stored this will increase the performance and scalability of the application enhance the user experience users experience smoother faster application response times and boosting satisfaction so what is that caching mean so we have told that caching can solve this problem so what is caching 
A cache is a high speed data storage layer which stores a subset of data. So if you are an application developer, you must have already used caching in your applications, either an in memory cache or an external cache. This data is typically transient in nature because it's not going to uh, persistently store the data in the uh, caching servers because these the data that we store in the caching servers are transient means after some time they will expire future requests for the data are served up faster than is possible by accessing the data's primary storage location so instead of accessing the data from the database every time we can easily go and access the data from the cache Caching allows to efficiently reuse previously retrieved and computer data. As I have mentioned, we can easily fetch the generated data. The data is generally stored in a fast access hardware such as a RAM instead of the uh, typical hard disk. The primary purpose is to increase the data retrieval performance by reducing the need to access the underlying slower database store uh, storage layer so slower storage layer means the database where the data is stored in the hard disk so in caching it's going to be a in memory or a memory based uh, data storage solution where you can easily fetch the data if you see this is an example of a typical caching system where the uh, applications makes the request the data we are uh, the, the request we are making will first go to the caching server and if the caching server is not containing the data it will go and get the data from the backend underlying uh, backend storage and then store one copy of the data in the cache and returns the response the subsequent request can connect to or can be retrieved from the cache itself so in web applications for loading the static assets we use a caching solution called a cdn content delivery network for serving the images or static assets like a CSS JavaScript files, we can use a CDN solution, which is actually a caching solution or caching implementation, but it is typically used for serving the static files. But in our dynamic applications, we have to use different uh, caching solutions. So the types of cachings that we use in our applications are either browser cache which stores web page elements like uh, images and scripts locally to speed up the subsequent visit like uh, CDN servers. So you must have used jQuery or uh, Bootstrap CDN or the uh, uh, images for loading the data like uh, the images that you see in Facebook is mostly coming uh, from a CDN server. So that means the actual data is stored in a backend data storage, maybe a database, sorry, um, uh, a storage server, like a file server. But you will be accessing those images, scripts, and other files from a CDN because that CDN is acting as a caching service. Database cache is another type of cache that we use, which is frequently accessed. The database queries are stored reducing the server load and query execution time so instead of making the uh, database query and execute the query inside the database server we can execute the database query once and store the retrieved data into a database cache and return application cache is another type where custom data specific to the application is stored and for quick retrieval within the application. So if you have some set of data, which is either a computed data 
or it may be a loaded data from the underlying data storage you can store such custom data into the application itself or inside the application itself mostly in the in memory and that can be later retrieved uh, uh, in the in whenever the client request comes distributed cache is another type of cache that is the cache is distributed across multiple servers or machines so there these are some of the types of uh, caching storages or caching types that we typically use in our applications so what is the importance of caching because it uh, improve the application's performance because most of the caching solutions uses uh, faster memory storages like a ssd which is typically uh, uh, sorry uh, which is typ the caching solutions typically store the data in the memory which is faster than the typical uh, data storage solution like a persistent storage solutions like a magnetic disk or ssd because most of the modern applications sorry most of the modern devices uses ssd based data storage which is faster than the traditional disk magnetic disk based storages but even reading the data from ssd is slower when compared to the in memory so if i want to improve the performance of the uh, data loading we we can prefer or we prefer to load the data into the in memory cache which is extremely faster compared to the other data storages reduce the database cost so typically when you go with the cloud based database solutions for example the uh, the azure sql db or azure mysql or postgresql or maybe azure cosmos db or in aws rds solutions or dynamo db or that kind of database solutions how they calculate the cost the cost is calculated based on the number of requests executed means how many database queries or database requests coming and how much time it execute the query inside the server what is the amount of data loaded from the server so based on that the cost is calculated so assume that there are 1000 requests coming and every request is loading the same data so assume that for one request execution it takes 10 seconds and you have to pay maybe one dollar for that just a number i am giving so one dollar for that so if there are thousand requests coming then you have to pay thousand dollar for that right but if you implement the caching you need to execute the database queries only once and you can store the retrieved data inside the caching solution whatever is the caching solution you use we can store that retrieved data inside the cache what is the benefit the subsequent request does not require to connect to the database and read the data it will directly read the data from the underlying caching storage which is connected to the application so that means you don't need to pay for the database uh, for the subsequent request because you are executing the uh, database uh, queries only once and uh, the subsequent request will be served by the cache so this can significantly reduce the cost of the database reduce the load on the back end redirecting the read request from the back end database to the in memory layer can reduce the load on the database and protect it from crashing at times of spikes so usually when a higher number of requests comes the back end database can go 
down or go slow if there is no proper scaling configured. So if there is a cloud based database solution, you can easily configure the scaling or auto scaling can be enabled. But if no auto scaling configured and we have a limited number of database servers, but the number of requests which is coming is very high. Such cases, the database servers can go slow or it may crash. To avoid this, we can use cache because cache will handle most of the requests. Means out of 1000 requests, maybe 990 requests will be handled by the cache itself because most of the time we retrieve the data from the cache itself instead of connecting to the database. So this will reduce the load on the backend data source. Eliminate database hotspot. What is the database hotspot? A small subset of data such as a celebrity profile or a popular product will be accessed more frequently than the rest. Consider that suppose in 2011, Sachin has uh, re uh, retired from cricket. So wherever we see the news comes about Sachin, so people are more interested to know about Sachin, what is his career statistics and other informations. So they will go and search for Sachin. Or if there is any other celebrity or some uh, movies released, for example, if there is a new movie released, people will go and start searching about the movie, the movie rating, the actors, what is the story uh, plot and all these things or what kind of genre it is. So all you will in search. That means more number of searches will go about that particular product or a particular uh, data. So in databases, it creates hotspot, which means the other areas of the database is not accessed frequently, only a single location or single record is continuously accessed. So this will affect the database performance and this will create hotspots in the database. To avoid this, such frequently accessed data we can load into the cache so that we can avoid creating hotspots in the database. Now coming to the scalability issues while using the in-memory cache. So we have discussed about caching and we have seen uh, how caching helps to improve the performance of the application. So all this time we were discussing about the in-memory cache. That in-memory cache can help the applications to improve the performance. But yes, there will be scalability issues when we use the in-memory cache. So what is that? Let's see, here we have a single application instance that uses in-memory cache. So here you can see this is the in-memory cache that is, created, that is created inside the application server itself, which means whenever the client makes a request, the uh, gateway or load balancer is forwarding the request to the single application instance. It is fine. But what happens if more number of requests comes? Whenever the number of requests increases, we have to create more number of servers behind the load balancer. If you see, we have a load balancer that is now connected with a multiple servers. So we can see there are three application instances uh, created, means three different servers created. And these three servers use in-memory database. So in, sorry, in-memory cache. In-memory cache means the cache is created within the server machine itself. So what is the problem? Let's understand. See, the user X 
you can see here the user x is making the first request so here is the first request what is the request it is the request for setting a key one with the value one so you can see we want to store a key one with the value one so this request will go to the load balancer and the load balancer will randomly pick a server from the backend so assume that that this particular server is currently selected and this request will be executed by this server and inside this cache it is going to store for this user key one equal to value one fine perfectly fine so when the second request comes you can see this is the second request whenever the second request from the same user but you can see this is for storing a new data correct like a, we are adding a new item to the cart shopping cart so first he added a mobile so which goes to the server one now he is adding a refrigerator so what happens this new request will go to the server two you can see this time the load balancer select this second server and the data will be stored inside the second servers in memory cache see the server is randomly picking this uh sorry the load balancer is randomly picking this backend servers okay now if you see when the third request comes here this is the third request when which is used for setting another key and value so you can see key key three and the value is value three and that is getting stored in the server three because this time the load balancer forwarding the request to the <clears throat> server 3 and inside the server 3 it store the data now we can see the first value which we have set that is key 1 equal to value 1 is stored in server 1 the second request or second value which we have stored is key 2 equal to value 2 is stored in the server 2 and the uh, third value which is key 3 equal to value 3 is stored in the server See, when there is a fourth request, again the load balancer is selecting a random server. So maybe the second server is selected this time, which already contains a data like a key 2 equal to value 2. And the new value that is value, so key 4 equal to value 4 is also gets stored here. So now you can see server 2 is now containing key 2 and the key 4. But what happens if he makes a read request? You can see the next request, what he makes is a read request. Get all the data I have stored. So he has stored four records or four data. And he is making a request for reading all the data. You can assume that it's a cart item. So he, is, he wants to see all the cart items. So what happens? The request five, that is the read request, will go to load balancer and the load balancer randomly selects this particular server see server 1 is selected and you can see server 1 contains only one record of user x that is key 1 equal to value 1 because it stored the data in the in memory cache so what happens in this time when the user makes a read request the data comes from the server 1 and he will get only this. But actually what he stored is four records, but he is now getting only one record. So what he do, he will make another request, maybe a request six for reloading the data. So that time the, the, the request may go to the server two and it returns another two records. That is key two and the key four which is completely different from the previous result, then he will get confused. What happens to my application? First time when I make a read request, I'm getting key one. Now I make a re read request, I'm getting key two and key four. Next time, he may get a key three. That means the data is coming in an inconsistent manner. So what is 
the solution for this? The solution is to use a distributed cache. Okay, one thing which I missed to, to update, like in this solution, what if one server goes down? See here, if the server goes down, if one of the server goes down, you can see the data which is stored in that particular server also goes because this uses in memory caching because the cache is inside the application server. So what is the solution for this is to use a distributed cache, which means instead of storing the data or cache inside the application server, we can use a separate caching server for that. So this will be a cache node or caching cluster or caching server, you can say, which is accessed by all the application instances. You can see all the application instances connected to a single caching node. So what's the benefit? Whenever the client makes the request for storing or retrieving the data, regardless which server is executing, it may be executed by uh, server 1 or server 2 or server 3. It can read and write the data into a centralized caching storage. So the benefit is whenever the user makes a read request, he always gets a consistent data because even if the request is handled by server 1 or server 2, or server three, all of them retrieve the data from a single caching storage because that is a common caching server or caching service. So a, uh, the, the request which is executed by any server will ret returns a consistent result. And also the benefit is in case if one server goes down, suppose if the server one goes down, still you will be able to retrieve the whole set of data because your caching server is different, right? So your caching server is different from the application server. So if the application server goes down, still you will be able to go and access the cached data. Now the question may come, what if this caching server goes down? So there you have to implement high availability for the caching servers, which means multiple caching servers you can implement, which we will discuss later. The topologies we will discuss. At that time, you will see how this uh, high availability for the caching servers can be implemented. So here, we can understand the importance of distributed caching in a distributed application environment. So what is NCache? So, so far what we have discussed is what is distributed application and what is the importance of using a distributed caching service. Now we are going to see what is NCache. NCache is a flexible and feature-rich caching solution that provides high performance and scalability to handle any transaction load. So far, we have discussed about the caching, uh, distributed caching solutions or distributed caching benefits. To implement such a caching solution, we need a caching server. And the NCache is that. The NCache is a caching solution or a caching server solution that provides flexible and feature rich uh, caching solution for the application, which means you can store and retrieve the data in the NCache servers. NCache is an open source in memory distributed store for .NET, Java, Node.js, and uh, Python. So, uh, the architecture is completely uh, different. 
so you will see a client as well as server part of the end cache which we'll discuss later you will be able to go and access the data from the end cache using different uh, strategies that also we'll discuss so you can see uh, an end cache server implementation using different languages dotnet java nodejs or python so whatever is the type of server implementation you want to do you have to use the corresponding sdk for that the ncache is an extremely fast and scalable cache store because of its in memory nature and distributed architecture unlike the database ncache is distributed and allows you to build a caching tier of two or more servers and pools the memory and cpu of all the cache servers into one logical capacity see like the databases uh, uh, unlike the databases it's not going to be a single server it's going to be a pool of servers so when you create a n cache it's going it's actually creating a n cache cluster so what is this cluster a cluster is a kind of uh, uh, means it, it's a it's a group of servers that act as a single instance so that means whenever you makes a request the user feels that he is making a request to a single instance but behind the scene there will be multiple servers so we typically call them as nodes so there will be two or more servers will be there because of high availability because in case if one server goes down you have to go and access the data from the other server so for high availability there are multiple servers we can configure so minimum two the ncache then lets you add more servers to the caching tier as your transaction load grows so if you feel that two instance is not sufficient for handling the uh, transaction request you can add more servers without affecting your applications availability means usually when we add or remove the servers we have to shut down the application but in case of ncache it's just like a plug and play which means any time you can add new servers without stopping your application uh, and the database that means it's a plug and play type of uh, caching solution so why we have to choose ncache unmatched speed experience millisecond response time for frequently accessed data compared to seconds with the traditional database calls so usually when we make calls to database as i have mentioned it will execute the queries within the database and returns the data so it may take some seconds but in ncache it uh, does not execute any queries instead of that it uh, just returns the cached data which is processed or pre created data scalability with ease linearly scale your ncache cluster by adding more servers to handle ever increasing workloads as i have mentioned you can add more and more servers to the cluster without stopping your application or without affecting your application high availability and disaster recovery never lose data and ensure continuous application uptime with redundant caching and disaster recovery features as i have mentioned there are different uh, replication strategies there and for high availability it always ensure minimum two or more servers are required to build the cluster so if you are if one of the server is down still you will be able to access the data from the other that that way it ensure the high availability and disaster recovery 
open source and enterprise options available so you choose the open source edition for personal projects or you can go for the enterprise edition with the additional features and support so understand when you go for the open source edition it's a for personal purpose and it is uh, will it will have limited features compared to the enterprise edition so for full features list you have to visit the ncash uh, website which gives you the uh, comparison difference between the uh, open source pro and uh, means professional and enterprise editions so enterprise editions are typically used by large organizations that provides uh, high end features for caching ways to use distributed cache what are the different ways we can use distributed cache? One is the typical caching method that is cache aside. What is this cache aside mechanism? The application is responsible for reading and writing the data from the database. So typically, the application will be directly connected to the database and it is responsible for read and write from the database. And the cache doesn't interact with the database at all. Then what the cache is doing? The cache is kept aside as faster, as a faster and more scalable in-memory data store. And whenever the application checks the cache uh, before accessing the database for uh, any data, means whenever a request comes, the application first check the cache. Is there any data available? If the data is not available, then it makes a request. The application makes a request to the database and load the data. And one copy of the data will be stored inside the cache. So that the subsequent request will uh, get served from the cache. This way, the application ensure that the cache is kept synchronized with the database. See, it is the responsibility of the application to load the data from database and put that data into the cache so application is ensuring that the cache and the database is synchronized second approach is read through or write through or write behind approach this is where the application treats cache as the main data source and read data from it and and writes data to it which means the application never directly interact with the database instead of that the application is reading as well as writing the data to the cache means the cache is the only source for the data the cache is responsible for reading and writing this data to the database thereby relieving the application of this responsibility so that means you just need to send the data to 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 the the uh, cache and the cache server is responsible to update this data back to the database so that means you don't need to make sure that the, uh, the that means the application need not to ensure that the uh, database and the cache is in sync because it will be that responsibility will be taken care by the cache itself if you see, this is the typical cache aside solution with that everyone is familiar that application, the application, whenever the request comes, the application is first checking the cache for the data, whether the data is available or not. If the data is not available, then it application will connect to the database and then retrieve the data and one copy of the data will be stored here. That means here the application is interacting with cache as well as database. So it first make a request to the cache to check whether the data is available or not. If it is not available, the application will connect to the database and load the data and store one copy into the cache. This is the typical cache aside solution 
But when you see the read through, write through, or write behind mechanism in N cache, so here you can see this is a .NET based server side solution. This is a cache cluster. You can implement this cache cluster server side code or server side implementation using .NET or Java or some other language. See here our client applications like web apps or microservices or server applications, when they make the request to the cache cluster, the cache cluster will check whether the data is available inside this uh, cache. That is, there is a client side of this. So it checks whether the data is available or not. If the data is available, then it returns the data to the client applications. But if the data is not available, it uh, read the data from the underlying data sources. That is the read through. That means your application is not interacting with the backend data sources. You are making a read request to the cache cluster and the cache cluster is responsible. There is a server side code implementation required that makes a request to the backend database and ret retrieve the data and it will also cache the data here. Write through means whenever you make a write request, for example, if I want to write the data into the database, you are not going to write data directly to the database. So typically what we do, we directly write the data into the database. So we don't do that. Instead of that, instead of that, the applications will write the data to cache cluster. And this cache cluster, server side implementation code is going to write this data to the underlying database. So what is the benefit? Your cache and the database will always in sync. But one problem in write through method is this updation is always synchronous updation, which means if there are 10 requests comes, all the 10 requests will be executed at the same time. So that means one request comes for writing. It will first update in the cache and then update in the ser database server. When the second request comes, it update the cache, then update in the database server. Then it returns the response. That means it's a synchronous operation. It will first update the cache then update the server. Then only the final response goes back. Means the client has to wait until it completes the updation of the backend data source. But this again affects the performance of the write operation. So we use a concept called a write behind. The write behind means the client applications will update the cache and it will get the response immediately that it operation is completed and then the cache cluster server side code asynchronously update the backend data source which means the client applications need not to wait until this updation completes so this whenever there is a higher number of write operations the client need not to wait for the completion of database updation the client applications will update the cache and it will get the response immediately that write is completed and it is the responsibility of the cache to update the backend data source that means that is an asynchronous operation okay so that is right behind approach so you can use read through to read the data which does not write the data into the uh, uh, database. But if you need a write implementation, you, you can use a write through or write behind. But write through is synchronous. But in case if you want to update your cache and the database using a single request or synchronously, then you go for a write through approach. But if you need a quicker response to the client applications, and you want to update your backend database uh, asynchronously, you can go for the right behind.
So this is the write through cache where you can see this is the client. Client makes a request to the cache client in the end cache. And this cache client is responsible to update the database. Uh, sorry, uh, it read the data from the uh, database. So that means here the 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 uh, client application makes a read request. The that read request will go to the cache client, and this cache client makes that request to the database server and uh, read the data from the data database. And it is storing one copy inside this cache client but when it comes to right through or right behind case this is the architecture that means the web applications or the other type of client applications makes a right request to the distributed caching cluster and this distributed caching cluster will have a a write through provider which is implemented using dotnet or java or some other language which is responsible to update the backend database so that means the update application data to the database using a write through mechanism or write behind mechanism it a uh, write behind will be asynchronous update that's it that's only difference If you see the caching topologies supported in NCache, so what is this caching topologies? So before understanding the caching topologies, let's understand the components of the cache cluster. So if you see, there will be client applications which connect to the cache cluster, and that cache cluster will have a server side implementation which can be implemented in .NET or Java or some other language. And this will be a dynamic cluster. So what is this dynamic cluster means? That we will see in the next slide. So there will be a dynamic cluster, which is a set of servers, which can be added or removed anytime. And it is providing linear scalability. And we also choose the caching topology or caching strategy. So how the caching is happening inside this caching server. And there will be intelligent replication to the cached data. And you can see the underlying database is all connected to the cached cluster. So if you see, whenever the clients makes the request, all 100% traffic goes to the cache server, but only 20% of the traffic goes to the database where the cache is missed. That means if there is no uh, cached data available, only those requests will go to the underlying data source. If the cache data is available, it will be serving the data from the cache itself. So what is this dynamic clustering? The NCache has a self-healing dynamic cache clustering based on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture that provide 100% uptime. What it means? This is a TCP-based cluster where there are no master or slave nodes and instead every server is a cluster, uh, in the cluster is a peer. So if in the cluster, the... Uh, nodes which is there inside this is all peer nodes there is no master slave concept so all the nodes are interconnected and there will be a cluster coordinator which is uh, which is considered as the oldest node one of the oldest node is considered as the cluster coordinator which manages the clusters membership distribution map cluster health and other functionality so one of the node is considered as the cluster coordinator which means it's not a master just a coordinator which is taking care of the cluster membership means whenever we add or remove the nodes it, it is responsible to inform the others that okay there is a new server added okay and updating the distribution map and ensuring the cluster health so this is the responsibility of the cluster coordinator this allows you to add or remove any cache server at runtime 
from the cluster without stopping either the cache or your application. That means you don't need to stop your cache or application to add or remove the nodes. That is the benefit of dynamic clustering. Whenever you add or remove a cache server, the cluster membership is updated and immediately at runtime and propagated to all the servers in the cluster as well as to the clients connected to the cluster. That means you will be uh, adding a new server to the cluster. Whenever it is updated, uh, the, the number of servers updated, it will updating the cluster membership. That is the responsibility of the cluster coordinator. And it is informing all the other nodes as well as the client regarding this new member. It uses different caching topologies for uh, uh, data storage. That is a caching topology defines the strategy for the data storage in the uh, clustered cache. It refers to the behavior of a cache cluster under different circumstances. These behavioral specifications help choose a cache topology the best suits your environment of the application. So that means there are different approaches how we have to store the data or how we have to replicate the data. So according to your application requirement, you can choose one of that approach. So what are those topologies or strategies? The first one is partitioned or partitioned replica topologies. Partitioned or partitioned replica topologies. Second is replicated topology. And the third is mirrored topology. So what is it? In partitioned and partitioned replica topologies, the partitioning means that you need to distribute your data between multiple nodes so that both the read and write data loading is distributed. So here you can see in this picture where partitioned the cache, where whenever you create a cluster, the server one will store some part of the data like a partition one will be storing one and two and partition two will be storing three and four which means if the if i have 10000 records to store it will be partis, partitioning the data and store in different uh, servers not one server stores all the data as your data grows you can add more server nodes in the cluster to hold more data because Whenever the data size increases, storing more data into a single server or two server is difficult. So you can add more uh, servers into the cluster. Each server node in the cluster is called a partition. So in a cluster, whenever we add a new server, it is called as a partition because it is going to store some part of the data. The only difference between the partitioned and partitioned replica topologies is that the former doesn't have a replica cache, which makes it prone of data loss. Because if you see here, this is a partitioned cache where the first server is storing uh, the partition one that is storing data one and data two. And the second server stores the second part of it that is partition two where we have three and four. So what if this server goes down? Or if it is crashed? We will lose the first part of the data that is one and two, right? Because we have only three and four available now. But if you go to partition replica cache, we can see every node is also storing or it is also representing as a replica. See partition one, is uh, in the server one store the data one and two and then server two's partition two stores three and four and if you watch here server one is actually a replica of server two see the replica stores three and four which is actually the primary store of the server two and the server two is actually storing the replica of one and two which is stored here Right. That means every node is actually storing some primary data as well as some replica of the other node. 
right? That is the difference. So what is the benefit? In case if this is crashed, still you will be able to go and recover the, the replica. That is one and two is here as a replica. So you can recreate a new server by uh, restoring the data from this. A replicated strategy. This topology allow you to have multiple servers and every server has the same copy of the data. Every server is the exact replica of each other. The failure of multiple servers at the same time does not cause any data loss. So you can see here in this cluster, we have multiple servers and every server is holding the same set of data. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Same data is here. That is one, two, three, four, five, six. And there is a synchronous update between these replicas. So benefit is if one server down, still the same data you can access from the other. So if there are five nodes or five servers in the cluster, all the five servers will have the same set of data. In case if three servers down, still you are able to go and access the full data. No problem. Okay. But the problem here or disadvantage of this is it consumes more memory because it's going to store multiple copies of the same data. The whole, the entire data set is stored here. So that means it is consuming more memory. Mirrored technology. What is mirrored topology? In mirrored topology is uh, a cache cluster that cannot have more than two nodes. So in this approach, every cluster that you create using the mirrored topology will have only two nodes maximum. And there will be one active node and another one is passive node. Means one is acting as the main and second is acting as the backup. Okay, that means all the read and write requests will go to the active one, that is the primary one, and the secondary one is uh, uh, is acting as a backup. In case if the primary fails, then you will be able to go and uh, get the data from the secondary, that is second server, which will be promoted as the next active one. And it will automatically create a new server. Okay, if it is implemented in the cloud environments, or you can add a new server. Okay, so that is the mirrored technology where we'll have only two nodes maximum. One is the active, that is primary, and second is the passive, which is backup or uh, secondary node. Now let's see how we can uh, create a .NET application with the uh, end cache. So we are not going to implement any uh, write through or read through or write behind type of caching server. So since uh, we can download and use only open source uh, end cache server, with the limited features. So it's only using the cache aside functionality where I can show you. Here, here I have already installed the end cache and this is the end cache manager where you can see there are two cache clusters. So if you see in this is one cache cluster created with a single node as you see. This is the local one. So this, if you want to add a new cache, you can do like this. So what is a node IP you can add? So this is the node IP you want to add. You can select or if it is an external server, means a different server, cache server, you can specify the IP of that. Then what is the type of memory store? You can see. It's local cache, published subscribe messaging, and a distributed leucine with a persistence. So local cache means it's an in-memory cache within this particular node itself. 
or a distributed cache with which means it you can have multiple servers and you, your data will be stored in different different servers at that time you will you should be able to go and select the topologies since this is a free version which it does not shows these advanced features for enterprise servers only you will get those options for adding so here i have just added one local cache and one distributed cache as you see here uh, demo local cache is my local cache and my distributed cache is my distributed caching server so both are in the same machine only because we have only one machine here if you want you can add a new uh, caches from nodes so means if you have an other machine that is having uh, the, the cache storage you can add those node ip here and uh, you want to add this node new node to which cache cluster so either to this or to this so here i have only uh, one instance here and in my dotnet application as you see this is my dotnet application first we have to install this nuget packages so i have created an mvc application for demo and uh, inside this application you have to install this alaki soft ncache open source dot sdk since we are using the free version you can use the open source dot sdk otherwise it can be enterprise dot sdk or professional dot sdk so open source dot sdk will have limited set of uh, features because if you are connecting to an open source server it will it requires only those classes and functions so open source dot sdk contains only limited number of classes and functionalities and for distributed caching if you want to try then you can use this ncache dot microsoft dot extensions extensions dot caching and you need to configure the distributed caching service in the services collection so you can say services dot add in cache distributed cache and you can specify the cache name so what is your cache name you have you can specify here so in my case if you see i have this cache name as demo local cache or my distributed cache so in my application in our application whenever you add those packages it automatically create two files one is client dot nc configuration second is configuration dot nc configuration so this client dot nc configuration is important because here you need to specify the list of servers in your cache cluster so here we have only one server so you can specify the server name but if you have multiple servers for the cache that servers list you can specify here so it will automatically connect to one of the server for loading the data and what is the name of the cache we have so in my case i have this demo local cache and that is the that is having only one server inside it that you can see this so this is the server ip and this is the cache id and the server configurations will go inside this means the cache configurations will go inside this so what is the cache topology type and uh, the cache name and it's other configuration whether logging is enabled and what is the cache cleanup the interval is 15 seconds so you can specify the other cache uh, server features inside the configuration.nc conf file so client.nc conf is very important for connecting to the cache okay so because here we are specifying the server name and the cache id and when you configure the ca distributed caching service as you see in dotnet 6 we can say builder.services.add in cache distributed cache for that we can use 
uh, the the extensions package where you can specify the configuration. So you are going to connect to which cache name demo local cache. So this demo local cache is already configured inside this. Okay. So you can specify or you can connect to multiple cache. So if, if you have a different cache configuration, you can specify like this. Maybe another cache server configuration you can specify here. Suppose my second cache. So this is another cache and it will have a different set of servers it will have. But in our case, we have only one cache and one server inside that. So this is not necessary. So what is your cache you want to connect? So demo local cache is the uh, cache I want to connect. So it will be choosing one of the server from this list. OK, but if I want to connect to the second cache, I can use this name. Then it will be connecting to one of the server mentioned in this list. See in our program, I'm specifying the cache name and the configuration dot enable logs true configuration dot exceptions enabled true. So that you can see here also the configurations, the server configuration means your cache configurations you can specify like uh, it's a in memory heap storage. The maximum cache size is this one and so on. So you can configure the the uh, cache settings by using this file. You can also specify the eviction ratio like if the cache is full, then what will happen if I try to add a new data into the cache? Then it will evict 5% of the old data. OK, so that is. The server configuration or cache configurations so that goes inside this. Now inside my controller, what I can do is this is injecting the I distributed cache. So this is the I distributed cache service is injected here and I'm storing that into a private variable. And inside my index method, I can use that distributed cache. So here I'll just comment this option. So different configuration. See here in the index method, I am trying to use that distributed cache to store a simple value. We can see we can use the distributed cache service instance. This is the injected service instance as you see here. This I am storing into this private variable. So that distributed caching service dot set string. So I want to set a string value into the cache. This is the key. So distributed cache key is this one. And what is the value you can store use here? And what is the default of uh, expiry time and other options depends on the uh, cache configuration. If you see here, what is the expiry time? OK, so you see here somewhere it is mentioned. Cleanup interval 15 second. OK, retention period is given 5 seconds. OK. So that means the uh, what is the retention period? Uh, what is the default storage mechanism? Everything is already mentioned here. But if you want to override the uh, retention period, you can go and use the distributed cache entry options. So you can see we are creating a distributed cache entry options object and setting the sliding expiry for that. So I'm setting the sliding expiry and setting the duration as 20 seconds, which means whenever I store the data, it is accessible for 20 seconds. And after 20 seconds, it will be expired. And it is 
sliding expiry option, which means if I'm not accessing it for 20 seconds, it will expire. If I'm accessing after 15 seconds, it will either extend for another 20 seconds. That means I have stored and then after 15 seconds, I'm accessing. So it extends its lifetime for another 20 seconds. So that is sliding expiry. But if you are configuring the absolute expiry, it will expire after 20 seconds, whether you are accessing it or not accessing it. After 20 seconds, it will expire. So I'm using it sliding expiry option. See, I'm going to uh, store the data into the cache using the set string method. And inside another page, in the privacy page, I'm trying to read this value. You can see I'm trying to get the value from the cache and trying to pass to the view using the view bag. So the cache value I want to print inside the view. So I'm passing it to the view using view bag. So inside my privacy page, you can see I'm printing this value. So this I'm just commenting as of now. Now let's run this. I'm just going to set a breakpoint here so that we can see how it executes. See, the request is hitting the action. Now, if I go to this distributed cache, as you can see, this is our distributed caching service. This is demo local cache. Can you see this is demo local cache? And here you can see the cache server configurations. Can you see machine name is equal to this is the machine that I have. Right. Now I'm going to store into this. See, it's storing the data. So it has stored the data. Now I go to the privacy page. You can see the same value I can see distributed cached value is this one because this is the value I have stored here. Right. And I, I'm reading that value using the key. So I'm reading that value using the key and printing it here so that I'm able to get it here. See now it is gone because after 20 seconds it automatically expired okay the same thing we can implement without this distributed caching so here i have used the i distributed cache service but without that also you will be able to go and use the caching service for that you have to use the cache manager service so inside your application i'm just commenting this now and uncommenting this section so if you see whenever i want to store some custom data into the cache i can even use the cache manager so the cache manager is coming from this namespace sorry this namespace alakisoft.ncache.client. So I can create an ncache, sorry, uh, cache manager. So I can create the cache manager dot get cache, which means inside this project, what is the configured caching server with this name? It returns an instance of that. Okay, so this is returning the data or returning the server based on this configuration here it is mentioned whenever we make a request to demo local cache it uh, connect to this server so you can see the cache manager dot get cache with this name returns an instance of that particular server and then i can 
connect to that cache or uh, I can store the data into the cache. You can say cache dot add and then you can specify the key and the value. The add method is always used for adding a new item with the key and value. But if the key already exists, then it throws an error. So we can use the insert method. Insert means it will override the key if it already exists. So I'm trying to add using add method. And if there is an exception raised, you can see here, this is the exception. And if the exceptions error code is equal to n cache error codes dot key already exists, means if the error type is key already exists, then I can use the insert method instead of add. That means cache dot insert, then the key and the cache item. So what is this cache item? It's an instance of the cached item. So you can store any object inside this. So this can be a string value or binary value or anything. So any object you can store inside this, it will be stored inside this cache. And I can read this value using the same cache manager. So we can see, I'm commenting the previous one and uncommenting this. I'm getting an instance of this cache here. So cache manager dot get cache with the name. So it returns the cache instance and then cache dot get it's for reading. And what is the type of data I have stored? I'm storing this value, which is a string type. So I can use string as the generic type. And what is the name of the key? It's my key. So it returns the data and that data I'm passing to the view using the view back. And this data, I'm printing it here. So I can comment the other and uncomment this. So this is also working in the same way that it is going to uh, store and retrieve the data. So let's go here and put a breakpoint to see how it works. Yes, it's hitting here. And when I say F10, it goes to the next. It creates the cache item and it returns the cache instance. Here you can see this is the cache instance which is connected to the same server, right? So this is what the server I have, right? So it's connected to that, right? And I am able to store the data into that. Yes, successfully stored the data. Now, if I go to the privacy page, you can see it is printing that value from the cache. This data is coming from the cache. So this is a cache aside mechanism. Because I don't have any server implementation of the cache, but if you go to the end cache, you can see there are different uh, editions, enterprise, professional, and even the open source editions available. If you go to, So here you will see the complete documentation of the end cache, the different editions. And here you will see what is mean by the dynamic cluster, partitioned cache, partition replica, replicated mirror and, and so on. And you can also see the uh, client and as well as server implementations. See server side, server side code for .NET. 
so you can implement the read through write through and write behind options using server side implementation and here is this is how it works okay so this is what the end cache and here i have demonstrated how we can connect to an end cache service which is uh, running in our machine and through the dotnet applications how we can connect and store the data into the cache so that's the end of this session now if you have any queries you can post your questions in the chat and i will be answering this
Guys, if you have more questions, please post your questions. Uh, guys, if you have any question, you can ask on chat box. I will dare to help you out. Uh, guys, also I shared this feedback form. Please guys fill this feedback form if you like this session. Uh, participants, please fill this feedback form, those who are remaining, and put done on chat box so I can see. Uh, thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. Uh, thank you, participants, to join this session. If uh, guys, please fill this feedback form we already shared on chat box.
Okay, thank you everyone for joining the session. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye.